Greetings. So good to be here with you again after a couple of weeks of a break. Got kind of busy there and uh, had our associate pastor take care of the last message. I hope you had a chance to, to check that out on YouTube or Facebook or on our website. But it's so good to be back in the helm, so to speak, and I so appreciate every one of you for your patience and uh, for your kindness. Uh, and wherever you are, I pray God would bring rich blessings into your life. Well, today's the first day of Advent. You know, that time leading up to Christmas, which is, observed, which is often observed with a variety of traditions and rituals. And typically, I'm not sure what your background is, but typically, but not exclusively, Advent is, is observed by liturgical groups such as the Catholics or the Anglicans, just to name a few. The word Advent itself means arrival or an appearing or coming into place. You may have heard someone use the word Advent in the context of Christ's first Advent and second Advent. In other words, Christ's first and second comings. And participating in Advent, uh, at least from my perspective, is a matter of personal conviction. You see, it's not mandated by the, the Bible. But now, having said that, I, I like what Pastor Ryan uh, Shelton from Evanston, Illinois, said about Advent. Quote, I have grown to love Advent, and though it is not a mandated observance in Scripture, there are profitable reasons to consider making Advent part of your holiday rhythm. Now, Ryan suggests uh, seven reasons, but let me just share two with you. Seven reasons why Advent is profitable to participate in. One, Advent brings slowness down Slow, the slowness during a, pardon me, a frantic season. You know, the Christmas holidays, I'm sure you've experienced this, can often border on some sort of craziness. And Black Friday has found its way well beyond the borders of the states. And if you're in the states, don't take this offense, but it's true. It's in Canada here as well. It's in many other places. And it's not uncommon that Black Friday for retail stores... Uh, they face often a stampede of uh, shoppers bursting through their doors. We have students who are busy winding up their studies uh, for Christmas. Families that are baking, uh, you know, lots of baking going on there. I know my wife does a bunch of that too. There's shopping to be done and traveling and visiting. Social calendars are jam-packed right through the season. But Advent, friends, provides an opportunity to slow down. As I've said in the past, to stay in first gear. And we are given an opportunity during Advent to slow down and remember God, who in his time and at the right time, not one moment later, not one moment sooner, sent forth his Son, as we see in Galatians 4.4. 4. And Advent, my friends, is a time to commit ourselves to slow down and reflect on a lot of things, but certainly on Christ himself. Two... Advent can strengthen our confidence in the promises of God. Can strengthen our confidence in the promises of God. If we allow it, Advent will direct us toward the wonderful and glorious second Advent of Christ. As we slow down and ponder God's faithfulness in ages past, we will be reassured in His promises for tomorrow. You know, as a people, I think we can all agree in some way or form that we're not that good at waiting. We're also not good at understanding the concept of uh, understanding God's concept of time when he said that Jesus is coming soon. Our time calibrator is skewed. Yet this Advent, if we so choose, we invite the Holy Spirit to strengthen our faith as we look at God's faithfulness to his people in ages past. If we so choose this Advent, we invite the Holy Spirit to fill us with confidence in the second coming of Christ. And for all of us, may the words of that familiar hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, be on our lips and in our hearts this Advent. So please turn in your Bibles to uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. We're just going to have three verses before us in that chapter that I will we can read together. So... Jeremiah 33, verse 14 to 16. 
Jeremiah 33, 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely, and this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you uh, as we now enter into this Advent time of preparation, of slowing down. I pray that we would do that, that yes, we can participate in the activities, that we, but we would be mindful to slow down, to take our time, and enjoy not only the time with family and, and, and maybe even some travel or some of the things that we get to do at Christmas season, have some turkey or however we celebrate it as followers of Christ, but Lord, that we would really ponder and, and, and learn to wait on you, learn to, to take our time with you and to just let you minister to our hearts and our souls. There's many things that have come out of uh, COVID that are still challenging in our lives. Some of us are struggling with things, Lord, but this would be a great time just to trust you, just to let you minister to our hearts, to let us focus on that wonderful, absolute first advent that happened, the incarnation of your son, Jesus Christ, and have our heads up in the air looking forward to his second coming. Oh God, may we be like that. May we be your people waiting in anticipation for Jesus to come again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we spend the next few moments in the book of Jeremiah, the approach will be very simple. We remember the three cardinal rules of biblical study, and that's where we begin. One context, two context, three context. And of course, this means as we deal with an inspired book of the Bible, such as Jeremiah, all of it's inspired, but as we look at it at this particular book today, even just these three verses in, in some ways, we, we must think biblically. We need to keep our opinions to ourselves for now. Of course, this doesn't mean we don't think. We use our brains that God gave us. And uh, yes, there are questions that we need to answer or to ask. We also need to remember this, that we are predisposed, sort of like a default method or default button to reject the things of God in our flesh. So we need to be mindful of that as well. Secondly, biblical study requires our full attention and effort. There's no two ways about it. This means we don't just sort of stumble haphazardly into the text. We prepare ourselves just like an athlete, physically, mentally, and spiritually, to engage with God's Word, for it speaks to us. Because if God's Word is something we hold dear and near to us, may I suggest that you and I put our money where our mouth is. Having cleared that up, we look at Jeremiah and we discover in the very first chapter, in the very first three verses of the book, that Jeremiah ben Hilkiah was God's spokesman. In other words, he was God's mouthpiece in the same way that others, such as Isaiah and Moses and many more, were God's mouthpieces. For we read in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he spoke it. He was his mouthpiece. And Jeremiah's prophetic ministry spanned approximately 52 years. And during those 52 years, Jeremiah's ministry took place during the reign of three kings of Judah. It began with the reformer king Josiah, then Jehoiakim, and finally with Zedekiah. And Jeremiah invites the reader into a troubling time, a very troubling time in the nation of Judah. Years earlier, about 80 years before the time of Jeremiah, the ten northern tribes of Israel fell under the might of the Assyrians. All this part of God's judgment due to their unfaithfulness and disobedience to his word. Here in Jeremiah's time, Judah and Jer Jerusalem itself would soon experience the judgment of God as Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, would be God's instrument of judgment. And let's ask why. Why was Judah on the precipice of captivity? Why was Jerusalem on the precipice of destruction? 
One can imagine as Nebuchadnezzar's army took up siege outside the gates of Jerusalem, someone saying, as it is written here in Jeremiah 5.19, Why has the Lord our God done all these things to us? Did God plug his ears from the cries of their despair? Did God have a forgetful moment? He somehow forgot his covenant with Israel? Answer, no. It was because of his covenant that God would judge Judah severely, just as he judged the ten northern tribes 80 years previously. You know, I find it, and we should all find it, an interesting uh, situation or thing when the creation somehow thinks it knows better than the Creator. Jeremiah asked some interesting questions in chapter 9, verse 12. Who is a man so wise that he can understand this? What was happening in, in, in Judah? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness that no one passes through it? It, it, was, a, it was a mess. And then in chapter 9, verse 13 and 14, right after these questions, <coughs> pardon me, God replies to those questions and said, Because they have forsaken my law that I set before them, and they have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it, and have stubbornly followed their hearts and have gone after the Baals their fathers taught them. They've gone after, my friends, the gods that their fathers had taught them to go after. Small g gods. See, Judah had broken the covenant, not God. That's the, that's the answer to why. And Jeremiah, speaking of the word of the Lord in uh, chapter 11, 7 and 8, said, For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear. But everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not do. Again, if you want to find out exactly what that all is, uh, just go to Deuteronomy, and, and, and we, see, we see the promises of a blessing and the promises of judgment or curses for if the people did not obey their Lord and God. So from chapter 1 in Jeremiah, God throughout the whole book called Judah to repentance time and time again. Over and over, God revealed that he had a plan to take down those who wouldn't obey his voice, who wouldn't acknowledge him. He also told them that it was Judah's responsibility before him to cleanse the nation. And over and over, God reminded Judah that he was their creator, chapter 5, verse 22. He, he was their husband, chapter 2, verse 2. He was the source of their very life, chapter 2, verse 13. He was their father, chapter 3, 19. Over and over, he reminds them, repent and turn back to me, and I will forgive you. So 52 years, three kings, God extended his mercy to his people, yet they refused to be healed. We see this in chapter 8, verse 22. They did not seek forgiveness. They did not seek after their Lord. So outside the walls, Nebuchadnezzar began his siege, and according to history, approximately 30 months later, he destroyed Jerusalem and he took many into captivity. That must have been a very, very awful day in the nation of Judah. You know, if we left this right here, it would be enough for us to realize the implication of God's judgment on Judah in relation to even our own time and context. God, my friends, is judging our country and many nations today, and uh, it's coming, and it's ready here. And it's interesting that many, and even some Christians, look at stories like we have here in Jeremiah and only see an angry and vindictive God. You see, isn't it true that God usually gets the blame for all the bad things that can happen in someone's life and in the world around us? How? Why? Would a loving and caring God let the pain, this pain into my life? Allow the terrible and evil things to happen in the world? 
You know, we can be sure that many of the Jews staring over the walls of their beloved city, Jerusalem, staring over the walls at the Babylonian army, were asking the very same questions. And maybe it was a dire situation before them that they forgot what God had said to them through his beloved prophet Jeremiah. Verse 14, right here. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. Maybe it was during God's judgment on Judah that people missed God's grace at work. You know, if you read through Jeremiah, you will come to chapter 30, 31, 32, and 33. And it will seem, those chapters will seem like an anomaly, like a glitch compared to the rest of the words, uh, the rest of the, the book. Chapter 30 begins with God speaking these words. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. I will bring them back to the land that I gave their fathers. And friends, from these very first words, the Lord through his prophet Jeremiah reveals his redemptive plan for his people, Israel. There will be a new day coming for God's people. And not only that, there would be a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, the Lord said, Behold, the days are coming that I will make a new covenant. And this covenant, my friends, would be different than the old covenant, that covenant that they had received on Sinai, Mount Sinai. It would be a new covenant. We read in 31, 32, Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. And God goes on to say in 33, 31, 33, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and they will be and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And God in his mercy and grace would restore their land. He would restore Jerusalem. He would give them a new covenant. And as we find here in verse 15, his people would live under the faithful leadership of a king in David's line forevermore. Well, friends, why don't we just step back into the 21st century just for a moment. You know, when we read a book like Jeremiah, and for that matter, the three verses that we have before us from Jeremiah, we should ask ourselves some questions. How does this ancient book about an ancient people during an ancient event apply to our lives today as followers of Christ? Question one, what are the implications for my life, if there are any? You see, these are good questions to ask when we read and study the Bible. Pardon me, or when we listen to a message like this. And my friends, each one of us must answer these questions for ourselves. We need to use those little tiny gray cells. Each one of us must do the hard work of studying the Bible. Your pastor cannot do it for you. Not your favorite author cannot do it for you. Not even a good solid commentary could do it for you. You have to do it. And if you permit me, for the next minute or two, let me give you some things that will help you. Like with books like Jeremiah, with any parts of the Bible. First, pray. Well, that's a no-brainer, is it? How often we don't pray. How often I don't pray. When I should start with prayer, endure with prayer, continue with prayer, and finish with prayer. When I study the Bible. See, we all need the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us from the very words of God before us. Second, when you pick up your Bible, when you pick up this book, when you pick up your Bible and wherever you are reading, look to find Jesus somewhere in the story. It doesn't matter if you're reading in Genesis. It doesn't matter if you're reading here in Jeremiah or in Leviticus or in Numbers or in Psalms or even all throughout the New Testament, Revelation itself, from beginning in Genesis to the end of Revelation, you will find the text is speaking in some way, some shape, or some form about Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. And I promise you, if you are consistent in praying and studying the Bible, 
you will find some verses like the three that are before us and see Jesus clear as day there. Well, with this in mind, let's just take a look at this, at these three verses a little closer, just for a few minutes. First things first, number one, the New Testament affirms the eternal nature of the throne of David. It talks about the throne of David here. You, you should see that there. So we look at Israel today, and we, and we one might say, well, there's no one in Israel today who is king over Israel, let alone a king from David's line. But here in verse 15, God promised it. In those days and at that time, it will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David. That uh, word branch is capitalized in your Bible. It is a messianic word. It's pointing to a future time and to a promised Messiah. So let's fast forward to a different time than Jeremiah here in the text. Let's go 470 years later. And the angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth. We find that story in, the, in Luke chapter 1, very familiar Christmas story that many of us uh, read all, every year and often. The angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, Luke 1, 26 and 27. And Gabriel said to Mary, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Luke 1, 31, 32. The New Testament affirms the eternal nature of, da of the David's line. Secondly, the New Testament affirms the internal nature of the Levitical priesthood. Now you go, well, I don't see this mentioned here in our text. Yes, it's not mentioned here specifically, but it's definitely mentioned and promised in Jeremiah. We go to Jeremiah 30, 30, 33, pardon me, 18. And the Lord said, The Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. <coughs> pardon me. Again, we look to Israel, and there is no temple there now, let alone a priesthood doing sacrifices daily. Is this going to be reestablished? Well, some would think so. I don't think so, because the Bible, I don't believe, supports that. We go the, to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews. You need to read that. It, it explains everything to you about what we're talking about here. But let's look at it briefly. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, we, here we read, uh, We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Who is the author speaking about? He's speaking about Jesus Christ, the high priest. Hebrews also reminds us in, in, in the old, that in the old covenant, in Hebrews 10, 11, and 12, we read, every priest stand daily at his services, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Friends, Jeremiah here in these three verses points to Jesus, Christ the Messiah, who has fulfilled the very words of God's written here in Jeremiah. For friends, Jesus is king as promised. King in the line of David, as promised. And Jesus is priest in the order of Melchizedek, the Hebrews talks about, as promised. Always interceding for his people daily before the Lord. This brings us back to our two questions. How does this text in Jeremiah how, apply to our lives today? What are the implications of any for my life and your life today? Well, if you remember, at the beginning, it was briefly mentioned that we are not good at waiting. And that's so true. You see, there was, not, uh, there was a time not long ago that waiting for an item, for example, ordered through a catalog might take two or three or four days to arrive. <coughs> Pardon me. I need some water, but I don't have any. The other day, for example, I purchased a TV online in the morning. It was in my hands by the afternoon. 
See, today we don't wait well. Everything is instant, instant, instant. You know, we've become an impatient lot these days, for sure. When we think about our relationship with God, we, we often demand that God answers our prayers and have the audacity, the audacity to get angry at him when he doesn't give us what, he want, what we want. We've also become a very forgetful bunch as well. We wake up sometimes, we wake up and sometimes we are faced with terrible things around us. <coughs> Hard things can come into our lives, right? And then we worry, and we worry, and we worry. We worry about money, we worry about our health, we worry about our kids, just about anything and everything we worry about. And we turn to anything and about anything and everywhere but God to relieve our worries and our anxieties while forgetting the promises of God. Hebrews 13, 5, the writer said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said that, folks. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So how does our text in Jeremiah apply to you and me today? What are, what are its implications for you and me? May I offer you two in closing. One, God keeps his promises even if it means we have to wait. Even if it means we have to wait. Paul, writing to the, to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, writes, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim to you, was not yes and no, but in him it was always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. May I suggest that we wait on Christ. Two, you and I need to understand this, the second point. We live in the here but not yet reality. The here but not yet reality. For example, yes, Jerusalem, after 80 years of captivity, was rebuilt, but the promised Messiah had yet to come. Yes, the kingdom of God has arrived when Christ was born. But the fullness of the kingdom of God has yet to come. This Advent, can I ask you, will you wait on the promises of God? Will you wait by faith for the second Advent as long as you live? When you look around you and you look at your life, will you cast all your worries and your anxieties on the one who promised you his easy and light yoke? Will you receive, will you receive the peace of Christ this Advent? Will you wait in hope? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your word. I pray for my brothers and sisters and whoever else is listening to this message. I pray, God, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear Christ this Advent season. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good day. Shalom.